Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to Tuesday evenings at the Modern. I'm Michael Moore. I'm an assistant curator of education, um, sitting in for Terry Morton. Um, it's my job, among other things, to ask you to, at this point, please silence your cell phones. But I uh, also to note that this is our final um, lecture of the fall series. But today, tonight, we look forward to our new uh, special exhibition, Modern Masters, a tribute to Anne Wynne for Marion. Uh, that opens to the public this coming Sunday, the 23rd. Um, our speakers tonight, um, I suspect, are, are familiar to most of you, perhaps even all of you. Um, they represent decades of curatorial experience, essays, interviews, exhibition catalogs, and many, many discussions in this space, in this format. Um, so, my introduction will be brief. Michael Lopping is an independent curator and art historian. He served as the chief curator here at the Modern from 1982 to 2018, and prior to that was the chief curator at Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo for four nine years. Um, his scholarship has been so wide-ranging that it would be perhaps easier to note um, modern contemporary artists that he has not written about, um, <laughs> discussed, or curated in, in his career. But here at the Modern, he curated exhibitions on Philip Gustin, Frank Stella, Anton Kiefer, and others in a, a signature style that I think demonstrates a, a, an active and really sensitive collaboration with the architecture, and I think many of you would agree. Um, our modern's current chief curator, Andrea Carnes, is also joining us, also has a long history here. She was the curator of the modern's focus series for many years, um, highlighting the work of new and emerging artists. Um, she also curated major exhibitions by Harvard and Birchler, Cause, Voices, and one of my personal favorites, the survey Mexico Inside Out, themes and art since 1990. Um, her efforts have led to acquisitions of works by Kahinda Wiley, Teresita Fernandez, Wangechi Mutu, and many more. Um, and most recently, um, Andrea has curated Women Painting Women, a groundbreaking and expansive look at the female gaze and figuration and its implications, which closed in September. Um, please join me in welcoming Mike Lofting and Andrea Parks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Moore. Are we? Oh, it's on. Now. Okay. It's on. Okay, good. Hi, guys. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I wanted to start by saying that. Michael Opping, Michael has created a beautiful show uh, to honor Anne Marion. And I mean, it's, it's a serious exhibition. It's a stunning exhibition. I think Anne Marion would wholly approve of the exhibition and in fact, love it. Um, and, and also just to say that, that I knew Anne Marion too, but really, I know her more through Michael's stories about her, having worked with Michael for 25 years, and he worked so closely with Anne um, on so many project, projects, including this building, um, that I got to hear his stories and you know the excitement of telling those stories and the humor of telling those stories and the respect that Michael has for Anne um, really all come together in this exhibition, but we thought it would be nice to share those stories with you guys tonight. So that's sort of the point of this lecture, uh, this evening. And a as a way of telling the story, Michael has put together some slides that he will click through um, to, to, ta <coughs> to talk about Anne. Um, but I'd like to start with a first question to you, which is, what was your impression of Anne Marion when you first met her? Um, and you know, what was it? Was was it like to work with her? Well, I've worked at four museums over a 45-year career. Um, that's four different boards, four different groups of patrons, in four different cities across the United States. I never met anyone like Ann Marion, ever. Um, I remember calling uh, Richard Armstrong the director of the Guggenheim, 
longtime friend of mine and saying, when I came here, I said, Richard, I think I have found a cross between Blanchett Rockefeller and Annie Oakley. <laughs> he uses that to this day. Anne, as many of you know, is the great-granddaughter of Samuel Burke Burnett, who founded the Four Sixes Ranch in 1865. It's one of the legendary ranches in Texas. I would learn that over a period of time. So Anne grew up wealthy, very wealthy in fact, but she grew up with cowboys. So there are these different sides to Anne. And when she inherited the ranch, and this was at a time when Texas ranches, ranches around the country were failing. They weren't doing well. And said, I would help you know, no, I'm going to make this the, the greatest ranch in Texas. And she did that. She modernized it. She modernized how they worked. Um, she modernized the logo, the Four Sixes logo, was not as simple and modernist um, as it was um, after Anne. And one could argue, I'll let you Texans decide, one could argue that uh, Anne Marion made it the most legendary ranch in Texas. There wouldn't be a film series called Yellowstone without the Four Sixes Ranch of Anne Marion. Isn't um, the, the four, um, Taylor Sheridan owns the ranch now? Taylor Sheridan is part of a group who, after Anne died and the estate was settled, bought the Four Sixes Ranch. That's how much he thought of it. So he's the creator of Yellowstone, and he's also a Pascal High School graduate. I didn't way. know that. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> but he talks about seeing, as a young boy, he talks in, in a couple of interviews about seeing these pickup trucks with those four sixes on them. And he said, I want a ranch like that. Mm -hmm. I want a ranch like that. Um, and eventually he would make a movie about that. There's nothing I don't like about this photograph. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. This is stunning. This is Anne Marion to a T. Um, I love the cowboy gear. I love the almost contraposto pose. I love the smile. I love the gaze. And I love her fingernails. <laughs> I mean, this is the two sides of Anne. Annie Oakley Anne and Cosmopolitan Anne. And you never knew which side you were going to get with Anne. And that's what made working with Anne so special. You never knew whether you were going to get Cosmopolitan Anne or Annie Oakley Anne. Why don't you take over? OK, got it. I did. <laughs> ah, good. And so um, this is an image of Anne's home in Fort Worth. This is an image of Anne's home in Fort Worth. and. Um, I guess I want to ask you, Michael, what was your impression of Anne as a collector? Um, well, she, she was eclectic, but I would call it eclectic elegance. But maybe start out by saying that her mother, Anne Valiant Burnett Tandy, I think I've got those names right. You've got to look at the, the family trees here, um, who was known as Big Anne as opposed to Little Ann, who was the Ann I knew. Um, Big Ann uh, had I.M. Pei build her a house in Fort Worth. It was between 1965, 1969. Pei built this amazing modernist house. Architectural concrete, by the way. Um, and it, it, the story goes that Pei didn't ever do residential homes. He only did public <clears throat> buildings. Uh, but he was willing to work with this woman because he thought she was building a museum in a residential area. <laughs> I suppose if you go through Westover Hills, you might 
think that. You might wonder, do people actually live here in Westover Hills? Um, and, um, but then Pei was looking through the designs, and he saw these areas, these large areas uh, for shoe closets. And he said, wait a minute. This is a house. But he was too far into the design, and they, they continued on with it. It's an amazing house, and it, it, it's, it's built for the public. Mm -hmm. And Anne's, Big Ann uh, was big into um, ancient art and modernist art, um, impressionism and modernism. And so Anne grew up with that, and I think she got the fever for modern art and the idea of how she could extend that. And I think we have another image of the interior. Yeah. The thing about Anne was she was a, a different generation of collector than you find today, I think. She wasn't trying to make a huge statement. She bought art to live with. She wanted to be of very high quality, and she wanted to live with it. She wasn't trying to say, I am this genius collector. You know, it, as long as it's important and I feel good with it in my house, then that's what I'm going to have. Um, well, let's talk about the new gifts to the modern. Um, I know you're a great lover of abstract expressionism and a scholar in that area, so you must feel really good about these five new gifts to the collection. These are game changers, these gifts. And, you know, from the day that I went to the first welcome party for my wife Pat and I here in Fort Worth and I saw these works on the wall, I was stunned, just stunned. I had heard about it. Um, but I had never seen her collection of a abstract expression. of It's small, but choice. I mean, this is Arshel Gorky's The Plow and the Song. Arshel Gorky is the key transition between surrealism and abstract expressionism. And the idea of surrealism's idea of imbuing deep memory into abstraction. And it has to do with his, his life in Armenia. He had to leave Armenia with his father uh, when the Turkish Empire invaded Armenia, and it was a genocide, basically. Um, and he left his mother behind, and his paintings are about, about being doing those, those, those things. If you look if you're at the list, you'll see like Armenian pointed toed shoes. This white area in the middle is, is a plow, you know, and the idea of plowing and, and Armenian song as, as farmers are plowing. Um, really, really important painting. You can't do a retrospective of Varsha Gorky without this painting. Um, and you bar didn't you borrow this painting from I her? did, actually, yeah. yeah. When I was at the Albright Knox, I did a Gorky uh, retrospective, and I had to have this painting. Um, I didn't know anybody here then. Willem de Kooning, one of the greatest pure painters in, in, in abstract expressionist history. Um, you know, he, he, his, his two main themes were women and landscape. And at some point, the women and the landscape came together. Um, but uh, when Gorky first did his women series, he was, the critics said, well, he obviously hates women um, because they appeared violent and turbulent. And in fact, he adored women. Um, and the women's series became one of his immor, impor, most important series of paintings. So this is also new, new to our collection new, as a gift. You'll see it upstairs in the exhibition. It's uh, not large, but it is potent. If you're a painter, you'll stand in front of this painting. And I would say the same thing about this. Well, this, <laughs> I've done a number of exhibitions of abstract expressionism. And you can't do a show of abstract expressionism without Mark Rothko. Um, this is one of the top three Mark Rothko's ever painted. And he painted a lot of paintings. And I've seen most of them. And this is stunning. And I was bold enough at one point to say, Anne, none of my business, but 
if you ever leave anything to the museum, leave that. And she did. Um, and why is Rothko so important? I think Rothko's important, I was thinking about it the other night, it's a little like food. When, when you have really great food, what do you hear? Silence. You just eat, that's it. And that's how you feel when you stand in front of this painting. But it's also, I think, about, um, it's like an interior mindscape. It's inside of the mind. It's the space inside the mind and the kind of vibrations that happen within your mind. And believe me, people stand, will stand and have, they haven't had a chance to until now, will stand in front of this painting for a long time. We're it's it's so lucky to have it now oh, in the collection. It's 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 a game changer by itself. It is. It is. Um, and so this David Smith also came from Anne's home, right? Yeah, she, Anne was, you know, when Anne started to collect, she wanted to collect American art. And as Anne would do, you know, you just go to the heart of the matter, which is abstract expressionism, the most important uh, movement in American art history, without question. Some might argue pop art, some will say, well, minimalism is great. It really all began with abstract expressionism. And Anne went right to the point. She didn't buy a lot of stuff because she wanted to live with it. Um, uh, David Smith was a, considered an abstract expressionist sculpture using a material, steel, um, that was about American industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it... It was, he, he, like Gorky, was transitional in the sense that he transitioned, for, he transitioned art history from uh, uh, expressive abstract expressionism into minimalism. Mm -hmm. Really important thing um, to have, and it was amazing to see it in someone's home, right inside the living room. Uh, but you don't, most people don't have living rooms the size of Anne Marion, <laughs> so. Well, so this one really is kind of a bridge in that way between abstract expressionism and another love of yours and ours at the modern minimalism. And um, we'll, we'll use this Richard Serra as an example. Well, this Richard Serra wouldn't have happened without Anne. When we were building the new building, we were all quite aware of the design of the building, its elegance and its horizontality. But what struck me was that it was really horizontal. And, and that was good because it, it really went along with the Kimball. And Ando loved uh, Louis Kahn. But I mentioned it, and I thought, you know, you know it's, it's so horizontal. People know where we are. We're a new building. Um, and it's so elegant. We're a building that really gets bigger as you enter the lobby. From the outside, it looks like an industrial Swiss complex, in a good way. Um, but uh, so I suggested that we put something outside that would, that would not only talk about the fact that we were here, this new building, but would sort of announce, excuse me, the cultural district as a unit. And um, I suggested Richard Serra, and, and I said, you know, Richard Serra makes abstract sculptures that are like a campanile in Italy. When you're walking in Italy and you come to a plaza, and all of a sudden you see this vertical piece of architecture. And so, uh, and I mentioned to Anne, you know, I said, and it really goes along with your David Smith. Because it's about industrial steel, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is dedicated in your name, right? Yes, it is dedicated in my name. And, mm -hmm. and, and when I was making the presentation to Anne, uh, she said, um, well, you're not trying to play to my sympathies, are you, Michael? <laughs> and I said, I would never do that, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, well, that's fine. I'll buy it. Let's, <laughs> let's just get it. Let's just get it. Um. 
Well, let's move on to another area that, that Mrs. Marion was very helpful with. Um, it was important to her, from what I know, to establish a photography grant for the museum. And um, I don't know if you encouraged her to do this or if it was her idea, but I know that when that happened, you started to look at American photography from the 80s and 90s in particular, and then German mm -hmm. photography. Um, how did this all come about? Well, uh, Marla, Marla Price, the director of the museum, I hadn't been here very long, and so she wanted to put me under the gauntlet right away and say, I want, I want you to make a presentation to the board. I want you to review what's in the collection and what isn't in the collection and where we should go from here. Um, and so I did, and Anne was there, uh, and I said, one of the things that I find interesting is that the museum had no photography in the collection, zero. I said, zero? And why was that? Well, I was told because the Eamon Carter had such a great collection of American photography, which they do, by the way, astounding collection of American photography. Um, and I said, but the thing is, photography has changed since the Eamon Carter was collecting, and they went up to the 50s and into the 60s, but it was a more traditional approach to photography, and in the 70s, photography in America started to merge with performance art and conceptual art. The photograph as a thing wasn't as important as the idea, what was going on in the photograph. It wasn't just documenting an American scene. Um, and so um, Anne said, well, that's a good idea. You know, how much would it cost to collect some of this stuff? And I said, well, and I had to think really quick because I wasn't prepared for that. I said, I think $250,000 would do it, which seemed like a lot of money. Remember, this was 1994. Four. What's that? What's a way ago? Um, um, I said about $250,000 and hoping that she wouldn't go, whoa. She goes, let me think about it. She called the next day and said, I want to give you 500,000. Wow. So in 19, 1994, just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Today that wouldn't do much, but then it did a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, but that was Anne's way. She would, she would ask you your idea and she would, whatever you said, if she liked it, she would double it because she knew it would be better. And I think of Anne, remember, Burke Burnett wasn't just a rancher. He was an oil man, you know, and they take risks. Texans like to take risks. That's what digging for oil is all about, taking risks. So if a guy like me comes in and is digging for oil, it just happens to be art, yeah. they go, Let's go with that guy. Well, plus you're a pretty good talker, but... Um, well, yeah, yeah that's, true. that's true, that's true, that's true. Um, that's, that's but, but, true. But, but while we're on this, on this image of mm. Cindy Sherman, mm. which is one of the, you know, the beginning of that photography grant and what, what you gravitated to, it makes me want to ask, was, was Anne Marion a kind of feminist? Well, I've had a number of women artists Mm -hmm. uh, ask me that question. Um, and my simple answer, the one that I love the most is, she's in the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. <laughs> That's harder than being a feminist. <laughs> but Anne was. Anne was a feminist in the sense that she really, she's an old school feminist. I mean, I don't have a vocabulary for the new school feminist. I actually didn't have a vocabulary for, you know, for the old school ones. I, I just lived through it um, as, as a male curator. But Anne understood when somebody was saying something smart whether it was a man or a woman. She understood it. And what Cindy Sherman did was she wasn't about the photograph. She was really a 
performer. This is Cindy Sherman, by the way. She was, and it's from her famous series, Untitled Film Stills. She was a performer, she was a makeup artist, and she was a set designer. And the and, photographer. <laughs> and then she took a photograph yeah. of it. So, you know, Anne got that, mm -hmm. Anne got that. Um, and we're lucky to have these photographs because of Anne. Well, I want to move on to some more of the photographs, this Richard Prince. The Richard Prince, this is a, a Richard Prince photograph uh, from the 1980s. Um, and they're appropriations of the famous Marlboro Man ads by Philip Morris. The Marlboro Man ads began in 1955. Um, and they were about making a transition from advertising smoking from being something that relaxes you to something that's active and male. And so they got these actors to act as, as cowboys, and, and it worked. It was one of their most successful ad campaigns ever for Philip Morris. And, you know, I proposed this along with the Cindy Sherman, and Anne was, you know, in the room, and everybody voted and agreed. And I thought well, that was great. And a couple of years later, Anne said, by the way, Michael, did I tell you that, you know, they, they, fo they photographed a number of the Marlboro Man ads on the Four Sixes Ranch? And I said, no, you did not tell me that. <laughs> um, and uh, she said, yeah. She said, yeah, uh, wait, I've got his name here somewhere. Uh, um, yeah, they came out. This was when they transitioned from Marlboro Man to, if you're my age, you'll understand this, uh, Marlboro Country. Mm -hmm. The Marlboro Country cigarettes. So it wasn't just, you know, uh, about a guy. But they came out to the Four Sixes Ranch and they hired Carl Biggin Bradley. And he became a very famous guy in this. So I don't know, art like imitates life, yeah. life. How c you can't make this up. <laughs> you, I mean, you know, I, I felt like, am, am I in some kind of parallel universe here? Uh, anyway. Interesting. I didn't know that about the ranch. Yeah. Um, so I wanted you to talk a little bit about the German photographers who you collected, including Bernard <coughs> Philip Becker. Well, it was important, I think, that we collect minimalist photography, photography from Europe. And, uh, you know, th this was a kind of photography that no one was really collecting here that much. Now... Everyone has it in their collection. But because of this grant that Anne gave, I was able to go out and just say, you know, do you have any of those burned in Hill of Besher uh, water tower um, photographs, which were done between 1965 and 1975? Um, and, and they did. Mm -hmm. And we had the money to buy them. Uh, they were just starting to pick up and, you know, uh, it's so different um, as a school of thought than Cindy Sherman or yes. Richard Prince, you know, this kind of typography. Um, but all of them have worked so well mixed in the collection with painting, alongside paintings yeah. and sculpture. And, you know, this is, these are often in the, minimal, the gallery where we usually hang minimalism. Um, I mean, one of the great things about, that's a good point about the mixing, about this generation of photographers is the scale of the photography. I mean, this is what, this is like five feet tall, mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that, four feet wide. You know, you can hang a photography like this. It has the frontal punch of a big painting. And we've been able to do that here to, to, to show photography and painting together, not, not segregated. You know, prior to this, you know, at the Modern in New York, you would go to the Modern, painting would be in all the big galleries, and then you'd go down to this little dungeon, and there'd be these little photographs, which, you know, they were important, they were historical photographs, but they didn't have the power. Um, and this was the beginning of that. And th this was so exciting for me since, you know, having studied photography mainly in graduate school, um, and we did have a few photographs before this. We have Gary, some Gary Winogrand photographs <laughs> that we can't ever get out in the galleries be yeah. because they're 
too small and we don't have anything else that fits that same kind of category, you know? So this really was something that you built and that I got to build upon. And yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so uh, also just thinking about this Bruce Nauman, this is a video, um, you know, some of the works that you brought to the table uh, were difficult. Mm. Either conceptually in this case or content wise. Um, you know, this Bruce Nauman, you know, Bruce Nauman's one of the most, arguably one of the most important American artists, but this was a tough work. So, how did you, you know, with, how did Anne react to a work like this? How, how did you argue this with her? Well, she always listened, always listened. And I explained that, you know, Bruce Nauman. You know, he, his work is about life, commonplace things that happen in life that somehow become emotional and that you could even, you can feel anger in it in, in some kind of low level way. And it, Bruce's work can upset people and, 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 and listened. And I said, and, and I kind of went out of bounds here a little bit and I said, and you know, Ant, he lives in Galisteo, New Mexico, and he has a ranch. He has some horses, and he has some cattle. He's a real cowboy. And Ann <laughs> shot a look at me, and she said, how the hell would you know? <laughs> And Good question. <laughs> as many of you know, uh, there are few people who have ever witnessed uh, me speechless. <laughs> but I was speechless. And she saw that, and the soft side of Anne came out. And she said, Michael, you're a fabulous curator, but you're a $5 cowboy. <laughs> she, she said that. She said, I wrote, I'm writing that in my memoirs. Um, I wanted to switch here to Lucian Freud. Uh, you you uh, curated this exhibition, co-curated the exhibition with the National Portrait Gallery in London. Another kind of tough exhibition in a different way. Yeah. I know Mrs. Marion was supportive of it. Um, well, you know, curators love to boast that they they lead the way all the time and, and, and that we're always right, and usually we are. Almost always. Um, but sometimes we miss things. And I'll never forget, Anne saw this show at Aquavella Gallery in New York and said, Michael, I, I think we ought to consider one of these paintings. Um, and this is a painting uh, of, of a woman named Big Sue, or the benefits supervisor. Um, a friend of Lucian Freud's who he spent years painting. It, it, it's a series of works. And uh, believe me, you got to see these in person. Um, they are intense. Um, and I said, really? You, let me get this straight, And You want me to present this to Perry Bass <laughs> and Lee Bass and Bill Hallman and all these guys, and she goes, well, I just want you to think about it. And I thought about it, and I didn't do it. I should have done it. it, it the painting was, I, we could have had it for $950,000, which, by the way, in 2002, 2003, that was a lot of money. I mean, that would have taken our whole, uh, more than our acquisition budget. And I just, I drop, I drop the ball on it. It's as simple as that. I mean, Freud is about, um, you know, he's about making, uh, he's about mixing paint with flesh. Paint is flesh to Freud. And his idea was that, you know, if I'm gonna paint flesh, I should paint somebody who has a lot of it. And Big Sue had a lot of it. Um, but I did drop the ball, but I said to Anne, I will do, I will make this up to you. And he only made, Freud only made like, 
you know, five paintings every three or four years. I mean, he worked a long time on these paintings. So it wasn't like I could just go out and get another Freud, you know. So I had to wait and bide my time and figure out what to do. And, and what I did was I had heard the National Gallery in Washington was doing uh, not the National Gallery in Washington, National Portrait Gallery in London was doing a big show of Freud. So I got on a plane, I went there, and I basically just barged in and said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this show with you. And they let me. I mean, they let me work on it, and I said, we're going to bring it to Fort Worth. Um, and we did. And you... I remember that these times. I think one time I was with you in London doing my own thing while you were doing this. You did the very last uh, interviews with Freud while he was alive. I mean, his last interviews. That's true. It was amazing. I mean, the, it was, the whole thing was amazing. The amazing that I had the balls to go there and do it. Mm -hmm. The amazing <laughs> that they let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that they brought it to Texas. But there was a key thing, too. My first meeting with Freud, and that's a story in itself, um, you know, I could tell he loved the idea of showing his art in Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas was a, as exotic to him as Tahiti. He just, he, I'm sure he had thought about yeah. Texas. He'd seen movies about Texas. Um, and so, you know, when the show opened, Anne came. And I said, show's for you, Anne. She said, well, thank you, Michael. You, you know, you did me right. You did me right. And, um, but we still don't have a Freud. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, another tough exhibition that we did, we did, and I know you wanted to show this uh, uh, slide of Carol Walker's work. We, we don't have a Walker in the collection. We took this show from the Walker Art Center, Philippe right. Verne's show. Um, we, and you were the curator. I was the curator in charge here, um, but but certainly it was a very tough show. Uh, yes. How did this go over? Well, <laughs> and the, well, Anne saw this show at the Whitney in New York, and and she said, you know, uh, we should think about taking this show. And I said to Andrea, what do you think about taking, you know? The Carol Walker show. I mean, I thought it was great. What do you think? Uh, Andrea said, wow, that'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a tough show. Mm -hmm. I said, Anne likes it. <laughs> I made this mistake once. <laughs> I'm not making it again. Um, and that was a good call. It, it was a good call. It was a great show. Um, I, you know, I wanted to kind of switch gears here to talk about the Tadao Ando building. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people think of Anne as the mother to the modern, and I know that you and Marla were so involved in the building process, and you were on the building committee, which is unusual for the chief curator to do. Um, what, how were the three of you as a team, and you know, what was that process like? Well, Anne was, Anne was an amazing leader in, in, in many ways, and you know, she involved people not just because she liked them, but she involved them for accountability reasons. If you're the curator and you're going to be showing art in this place, you should be on the building committee. I don't want to hear from you that you don't like the building that I built. <laughs> if we build a bad building, it's as much your fault as my fault. And that's, that's just a smart business person. She knew how things worked. Um, and so it, it, it was great. And, and, and from my standpoint, I dealt with the galleries mostly. And, but I was witness to Fort Worth patronage um, very close up and a woman leading the charge here. Now, I'll also say as a historical point, um, Anne was just expanding on a tradition that is really not talked about as much as it should be. And that is that there wouldn't be many great American museums without women. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the great 
American art museums were begun by women. The Metropo Metropolitan Museum, Albright Knox, Corcoran Gallery, all of the early great museums were begun by women who did little exhibitions in libraries. And then they got their husbands to put up some dough to get them another building and then another building. You know, um, and Anne's mother was a part of that, Big Ann. Um, and you can imagine, you know, it's like a, a, a Texas woman saying, honey, now I'm gonna need some money for a new museum and you're gonna put it up or you're gonna sleep in the barn. <laughs> um, and, and she did that. And so Anne, Anne went out, and this is a, a, an important part of the oral history of this, of, of Fort Worth and this museum. <clears throat> Anne went out and brought people together. She brought all the important families in Fort Worth together. Um, and the one thing I remember, one, the thing that I always like to tell at a dinner party is, they're what I call the, the three sisters effect in regards to the cultural district in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And the three sisters were Kay Kimball, um, Ruth Carter Stevenson of the Amon Carter, and Ann Marion. And um, Ann went to the other two and said, now I, I wanna do this thing and I need your help. And of course, they both, well, Kay was in right away. Um, Ruth was starting a project of her own. Um, she wanted to redo the Amon Carter. She was gonna need a lot of money. She didn't know whether she could help. And again, this is part of the problem, being too close to things you don't know no enough about, which is where I was. And I kind of, I kind of got a little uppity, and uh, and I said to Anne one day, I said, "Well, I don't, I don't understand this Ruth Carter Stevenson. I, what's that about? I thought, you know, she, she's supposed to help." And Anne said, "Now, you wait a minute, Michael. Just wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've known Ruth Carter Stevenson even for a long, for a long time. When I was a young girl in college in San Francisco, I was out there by myself, and." I was very lonely, and one day, I got a big, heavy package in the mail. I took it up to my room, and I opened it, and it was a case of Dr. Pepper, <laughs> and it was from Ruth Carter, and I've never forgotten it. And I said, oh, okay, and she said, she said, don't you worry, Ruth will come through. And although she wasn't able to help as much with the building, later she came through in a number of important acquisitions. So Anne knew what she was doing all along the way. So when, when the building opened, we were, you were installing for the first time in this building, and, and, and you borrowed this Martin Purrier, which is now one of the most iconic works in the collection. Um, how did this become a part of the collection? Well, it again, it was, it was part of Anne's pushing this give and take thing. Uh, you know, when we were doing the design for the building, we talked not just about design, but materials. And I had said that I thought it would be great to not just have every gallery be a white cube, but that we could have uh, one or two rooms that were actually of concrete. Because I had, uh, in other museums, I had hung paintings on concrete type walls or brick walls, and they can look great. Depends on the painting, depends on the work. And so Anne said, okay, and, and we, we put that into the equation. We want, you know, one or two concrete rooms. As the building started to go up, and I would come down here every other day, I'd go into this room and go, holy shit. <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and, and, you know, there'd be times when I'd be with Anne, and, and she's so great. She'd go, so now what are you gonna do, Michael? 
I'll figure it out, Ann. I will figure it out. And this is a great example of, you know, a push and pull. And this, this work was in Martin Purrier's studio for years and years. And, and I asked him if, um, if I could borrow it uh, for the opening of the building. And he said yes, eventually. He fought me on it for a little bit. And I said, believe me, you won't regret this. Um, it comes in, this piece, it doesn't come apart. So it's like, you know, 40 feet long, 45 feet long. So the crate is 40 feet long. It's a giant wooden crate. It cost $10,000 to ship it one way. You know, and this was on, you know, this, this was my wild catting. I was going, okay, we'll see if this works. <laughs> um, and it worked, and eventually we bought it. And if I'm correct, we were able to buy it through the help of Ruth Carter Stevenson. Mm -hmm. So it. Uh, yeah, I think everyone, they knew it needed to stay in Fort Worth. Needed to stay. And they made it happen. Um, so when you came to the modern, um, there was a shift toward European painting. Um, and I just wondered, like this Francis Bacon from, you know, the British painter Francis Bacon. Uh, wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, when I came to the museum, and 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 Marla had said, why don't you uh, evaluate the collection and where it could go, and and it was clear to me that this museum had focused on American art um, in a good way and had gotten some great things, um, and American art was a very potent thing. It has been all the way through, but particularly up to 1965, 70, 75. In the 80s, there was a switch, and really all the attention was in Europe. And some of the greatest things happening were happening in Europe. And this museum didn't have any European works, really. Not in, they had some, but not really significant things. Um, and so I suggested that, that we do that. Um, and I, I suggested also to Anne, right, Anne Marla, right before uh, the building here was going to open, and I saw how beautiful it was, how gorgeous the galleries were, and it scared the hell out of me. I thought, now wait a minute, are all the critics going to come and say, great museum, the collection doesn't really hold up to it. it. You know, it would have, but that was my paranoia. And I said, what if we bought some works of art, you remember this, mm -hmm. and we didn't tell anybody. We just bought them, and then when the museum opened, they would go, wow, I had no idea they had that. <laughs> um, and so, Anne said, would $10 million do it? You know, again, I was probably thinking five. Um, I said, yeah, I think that would do it. <laughs> um, and so we bought things like this Francis Bacon painting. Mm -hmm. This is Francis Bacon's oh. first self-portrait. Very, very important painting. I'm going to guess, we could look it up, that we paid five million dollars for this. If you look up the auction records for uh, Francis Bacon right now, you would find that this painting would easily, easily sell for 85 or 90 million dollars. That's not an exaggeration, just Google it, you can do it. Um, and it's true of many of these paintings, a Gerhard Richter, great uh, German landscape painter, and some Kiefer, I think you have, mm -hmm. yes. Um, all of these things. And I remember walking through the museum. Anne came to the museum, and I gave her a tour of some show I did. I can't remember, maybe the Frank Stella. I can't remember what it was. Um, but the show was up, but on the other floor was the collection with all of these in it. 
And we were walking through, just Ann and I, we weren't talking, and she stopped. And she turned and she said, you know, Michael, we couldn't do this today. We couldn't do this again. And she's right. It would take a billion dollars. That's where the art market is today. But, you know, that's what happens when you have a great patron. You're able to take advantage of moments. And boy, you're lucky. It's not, somehow it, it, it seems planned, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is just luck and the right people coming together at the right time. Um, well, that, we're, we're to our last slide, but that also makes me want to ask, um, and then I think we should, the audience might have a couple of <clears throat> questions and we'll have a couple, few minutes for that, but just as a last question to you, um, you know, you worked with Anne Marion, you've been a curator for 45 plus years, 45 yeah. and running. Right. Um, how have you seen the role of the patron shift over the years, or has it, do you think? Well, I had, uh, you know, I retired from this museum, I think, five years ago, and it's a, it's a different thing. It, it, um, uh, Anne is an old school collector, you know, Anne gave so much money for this building, for the collection. Um, and when the building was up, there was a groundswell to name the building after Anne Marion. And Anne Marion said, no. This is for the city of Fort Worth. It should have Fort Worth in the name, and that's it. Not the Anne Marion Fort Worth Museum, the Fort Worth Art Museum. Now, there aren't many patrons today who would do that. Um, and I'm not, I'm not judging. It's their money, you know. That was, a, that was a term I used constantly throughout my process with Anne. Anne, I know this is not my money, but this is what I would do. Um, but, you know, today, you know, I think, uh, first of all, a lot of collectors spend a lot of money buying a lot of art for themselves, which I think they may intend to give to a museum. But uh, sadly, what I see is that they fall in love with their own passion and forget about the city. And so they then decide, well, I think I'll just make the Michael Opping Museum of Art. We don't need the Fort Worth Museum. We'll, we'll have a Michael Opping Museum of Art, or you know, using their name, not mine. Um, and 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 I think that has a lot to do with the economics of it. Um, and uh, all I can say is I am so grateful to have worked with Anne Marion. There, uh, that's all I can say. Well, I can't wait for you all to see the exhibition. It, it is truly stunning. I think you'll be so pleased to see and remember all of the things that Anne Marion has done for us um, in the Ondo galleries. Do any of you have any questions? We have just a few minutes left. Yes. I see one hand up. Yes. Um, love the modern, love <laughs> what we do with it. Uh, a, a lot of the paintings now are more Caucasian, mm -hmm. and we're moving into a theme of like Kendall Wiley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When is the modern going to move more into uh, other ethnicities in their presentations in modern art, since modern art is more of the public well, than of Caucasian well, white? Maybe you haven't been here for a few years, but Andrea and <laughs> and and her people, I mean, her 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 curators have have really moved us in. I mean, if you look at what has been collected at this museum uh, since I left, the white male, uh, since I left, you'll find that a ton of uh, art of uh, artists of color and women, you know, and really ahead of the Me Too movement ahead of it. But it, you, you might, maybe you haven't noticed it. I could take you out into the galleries right now and show you the things that Andrea has collected. 
Um, well, I, I'll, I'll also add to that just to say... Please it, don't put me on the defense. No, no, I'm no. I'm an active member already. No, I get Good. You. We want you to stay. But also of the modern for several years. Please don't put me in the defensive. I'm here for dialogue. Okay, so I'm... I, and I want to address that. Um, we, in the last five years, we know this because we just have run the numbers. We mm-hmm. have upped our percentage of black and brown artists in particular and women artists by 35%. We actually are setting a goal now to move that way forward. Uh, And we don't look very different from other museums across America uh, in terms of when the percentage numbers have jumped up. I'm not using that as, that doesn't make it acceptable. But I'm just saying, we're very aware of that. We're looking at it. There are plenty of good artists. There's all kinds of diversity that we can bring into the galleries, both in terms of programming programming, and in terms of the collection. And we are looking very carefully at that. And we're, we're working on that wholeheartedly right now. In fact, this whole day today before before tonight was all about that it's about and this and i'm not just saying we started that today but i'm saying you know we're definitely uh we're definitely having these conversations and i did, i wasn't trying to put you on the defensive i was just trying to have dialogue with you because i want you to go out and look uh, at what has been collected over the last four or five years also, I think it's important to note that it's, it's not a simple issue. It is a complex issue. And you, you just can't switch gears right away. I mean, you can't, you make a fast turn, you turn the whole boat over. But things have to change. Um, and, you know, museums are trying to do things, they're trying to find ways. And I, I'm happy to say I'm simply an observer of this. I'm not. All of the presentations of people in the museum today, today, uh-huh. are Caucasian. No, it's not true. No, no. I'll be happy to take you through. Not tonight. I can't do it tonight. <laughs> uh, but I'll be happy to take you through the museum and show you a whole bunch of reasons you're wrong. But what I'd like to point out, oh, go ahead. The characters. Yeah. Not the artists, the characters are Caucasian. What do you mean? I'm sorry. That's not true either. What does that mean? There's a big, there's a couple of big sculptures that it, as soon as you walk in, uh, anyway, go ahead. Yes, um, I'm so captivated that we now have two Rothkos in the collection. And my question is, since one is a warm, a warm color palette and now the recent acquisition is a cooler palette, where would you, if you had to position them both, at once, which gallery would you choose in the museum and why? <laughs> well, I mean, they're both up right now. Um, so you, and you'll see, yeah. uh, you'll get a chance to, you'll get a chance to answer your own question maybe when you see the show. Um, they're both in the same room. Okay. And so, I'll, so I'll be surprised how they're going to speak to one another, whether they're side by side or across. But I'm wondering, the first, the first Rothko, was that also an acquisition that Ms. Marion assisted with? She assisted with it. And not so much in money, but in um, intention. And she was pushing for American painting of that period and the board excuse me, was very much behind it. So I have taken a little bit of artistic license with this show, um, if you know what I mean. I didn't, anyway. That was a good question. It's spectacular how you have all worked together and how she has helped shine an international spotlight on our city um, in terms of the art world. So yes. well done to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I see two more, we're gonna answer two more hands up, yours and yours back there. We'll start with you and then we'll, we'll end because it's so. What was Anne's favorite foreign painting, mm. in your opinion, or if she stated it? She didn't state it. I mean, and she probably wouldn't in front of me because, you know, um, I didn't show you all of them, but a lot of them are men with gigantic penises and then women with 
their legs spread open, so it's hard to sit there with your favorite patron and go, well, what are you thinking? <laughs> I don't know, what do you think, Michael? I mean, you kind of have to just figure out that she's a great painter and, and, and One more back there. Oh, sorry, Claire. Back here. I am very ignorant when it comes to modern art. And I moved to Fort Worth about two years ago, and, and I love coming to the museum district. And I just want to thank you for your curated tours, because it helps me really understand modern art. So, and, and I love what you're doing here, working with the other two museums. So thank you for educating an ignorant person on modern art, because I do want to learn to know. Thank you. And Claire, we'll take you as a last question. Where do we find the next day, Marion? <laughs> That's a very good question, and the sad answer to that is they don't, not only do they not come along every decade, they don't come around every quarter of a century. They just don't. If you look at the history of the modern, look at the history of, of the Kimmel, it, you know, they just, they just don't come around. So you just hope to be there when they do. That's it. Thank you all so much and thank you much.